with pleasure. Uh, I introduce Eddie Khan from uh, Academica Seneca, who's going to tell us, who's going to give us a continued invitation to multiple issues. Yeah, thanks again for um, the opportunity to get this lecture series. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's quite ambitious goal, I guess, to, you know, in two lectures to explain, you know, the whole idea of motivic sheaves, um, sort of from the beginning. So last time we tried to, um, get some insight onto sort of why, you know, why Balance and made, made these, um, conjectures about motivic sheaves in the first place. And, you know, so we took this detour through um, the wave conjectures and pure motives and, and um, you know, six functor formalisms and all these things. And uh, yeah, so today um, I'm gonna start off where we, where we ended up, which is, you know, the statement of um, Valenson's conjectures. And um, yeah, I'm gonna try to give some, um, give you guys some flavor of, um, yeah, what it what it is like to, I guess, to work with um, what we now were, you know, like I guess motives mean many different things to many people, but obviously this, you know, this lecture series will be, I mean, this lecture will be about um, sort of, you know, the derived category of motives, which is, um, which is something non-conjectural, um, but you know, it does. So it's not the it's not the um, abelian category that that you know Balenton conjectured and you know still is conjectural but uh we'll try to see what kind of information it does capture and and sort of what, what you can do with it uh so um so recall that yeah we have we're supposed to have a, some kind of system of of categories um such that the derived category will have uh, the formalism of the six functors and a um, few other standard properties. So I guess the other main point is you know, this is supposed to be some kind of theory of mixed motives. So unlike the pure motives, uh, we now have you know non-projective motives in there as well. So we want some kind of filtration on on these objects, on these mixed motives, such that uh, the graded pieces of these filtrations are like semi-simple objects. And the semi-simple objects are, you know, also conjecturally supposed to be giving back the original category of pure moments. And then, yeah, we should also have some realization functors um, from this motivic theory back to Eladic theory and Hodge, Hodge, yeah, some kind of Hodge realization or Betty realization uh, to, um, you know, recover a singular full Um So, yeah, so let's yeah, so if we if we think about this conjecture a bit, um, we are led to um, expect. I mean, we're led to deduce that you know if this is true, there there should be some corresponding theory of um, motivic cohomology. And so, I will kind of um, sell this analogy here that if you know if S is let's say S is an affine scheme, then you can look at the category of vector bundles as a subcategory of uh, coherent sheaves. And that's some abelian category of which you can take the derived category. And, you know, sort of, this is sort of, this is this is the derived category and in the other, other direction, you can take the, the heart of the standard T structure. And so like these, these are kind of interchangeable. Um, now in, in this world, in this motivic world, we know how to construct this thing. So these are, this is a kind of, very easy to understand category. And these objects are analogous to vector bundles in some sense. You know, when I when I say projective, basically what I'm what I have in mind is that there are no interesting X groups uh, between the, the objects, uh, you know, between vector bundles, for example. And similarly between between these objects, there's no non-trivial X. That's essentially why this category is much easier to understand and, and to define than the full category of mixed motives. And so if we have the subelian category and, you know, in particular as derived category, we should have some, some kind of X groups. So in the, in the coherent world, X groups, the X groups are giving us coherent cohomology. Um, and so whatever this thing is, right, this is very natural to call this some kind of motivic 
cohomology. All right, so that's sort of um, by definition, perhaps one could say, okay, motivic cohomology is, is a sort of the, you know, given by taking X groups in, in this thing. Sorry. I have so, yeah. So, sorry. Yes. I, I'm, I, I mean, previously you, you have coherent sheaves, but on coherent sheaves, you have finiteness conditions. I, I wonder whether in the motivic world, you, I mean, and because you, you, you talk about this an, an, analogy, Yes. Because I, I, yeah. I so I, I I wonder whether you 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 don't take a quasi coherent sheet. I mean because I mean the more precise analogy would be uh, if I put Qs okay. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, of course, you could instead you could put some finiteness condition like some kind of looking at only some constructible sheets in some sense, constructible motivic sheets, and then you would be sort of again um, anal analogous to the Tokyo coherent ones. But I will be, yeah, in many things like this, I will be not completely precise. Um, and I so let me just write coherent sheets just to, yeah. And, and the key here, your vector space, because your vector space, I guess that you have finiteness condition, I mean, just like dualizable object also. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but, but your, M, your MS, do you have any sort of, I mean, finiteness condition? Of... I mean, these objects, should be thought of as already finite in some sense. Okay, so, so the third, yeah. the third co column have have finiteness, but the previous you, you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. These these are uh, to, yeah. To be really precise, I would say I would put finite projective here maybe, and uh, here I would put the big categories or yeah, but it, it, yeah. Anyway, this is just to. I mean, you should not take this too seriously either, but just to sort of give some idea of why, you know, why this thing is so much more complicated than this thing. And also to explain that, you know, when you have these, when you have these non-trivial X, then you can in particular deduce that, okay, if, if we have, I mean, if we believe in instance conjectures, then there has to be some, some kind of cohomology theory represented here as well. Um, and so, okay, we can we can you know make some precise definition. I mean, if we had if we knew what this category was, but um, let me note here that of course, if we have the derived category of this, then you know it would be sufficient to define this. So, if you have a derived theory of motives like a, I'm sorry. So, uh, so with that X group, yeah. um, which of those terms have you? So, mu of S is the motive of associated to S. Uh, yeah, sorry. So this is, yeah, you could take it as a mu. Um, it, was, it was supposed to be like a capital curly M, but so, so, yeah. Oh, mu, sorry. Okay. Um, would also work. So my, well. my, my real question is what's the right-hand <laughs> yeah. side? Mm -hmm. What's the right-hand side of the equation? So so um, curly M of S is the motive associated to S? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the, this is the abelian, you know, uh, hypothetical abelian category that, of mixed That I'm okay with. Over, the, over S. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, yeah, so this is the motive of S inside this category. Okay. Uh, and, so that and, then, and mu of S um, twisted by Q. That's the Q with T twist of the motive. Um, yeah, the, this this one. Yeah, this is the P P uh, T twist. And, and yeah, have you exactly. have you told us what the Tate motive is? Uh, I mean, I have not really defined, you know, given any precise definition of motive, so I cannot really. Okay. Yeah, I, I cannot really tell you what it, this is, other than the fact that. It realizes to the things that you would think of as, you know, so it's, in, in the Italian theory. Yeah. Maybe a question which may be clarifying or just a different question, which is this is at this point you're motivating uh, definitions rather than giving definitions. Like, like you want something which is going to have certain properties and it should look like this. Yeah. The, uh... yeah. 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 So, right. So th this is sort of, yeah, everything is completely. Um, I mean, no, nothing. Nothing is really like I have not really defined anything in in this whole lecture series, and I, I will not really give any precise definition of anything. So everything is just completely just um, ideas. I mean, you can make these definitions precise, uh, except I mean, except for the ones that you cannot, like this one. You know, this <laughs> X group. Uh, in this case, you know, this particular statement, we can we will make that precise in some sense because we will be able to. You can still define X groups just by having the derived category and taking. Palms in there with the shift, 
but um but yeah you, you should not uh really i guess think about the definition so much but more sort of the yeah as as Ravi said just kind of trying to understand the the ideas or what what this these conjectures are supposed to predict um so 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 can i and so uh, so it looks like we can even follow this philosophy in a case that we understand where we have varieties with vector bundles, projective varieties with vector bundles, and somehow we're going to end up inventing the derived category of coherent sheaves. Like, is that the thing that that's going to come out of the out of this yes. philosophy uh, from this on yes, exactly. on, on non-projective varieties? This is even like that's the thing which is going to suddenly is this is going to predict the even though we secretly know about it, but it's going to somehow have it, it, that's. It's um, telling us to invent them. Is that is that what we're following in the footsteps of in that case, and we're trying to generalize it? Or in, um, in some sense, yes. Um, and here, I really, I mean, for the analogy to be really precise, I really oh, I want to so work with affine. With um, affines, not project, not projective varieties, right? So, so you have a nice small local thing, and we understand vector bundles yeah. on affines, and from this, we're going to discover just we're going to discover uh, more generally uh things on yeah on exactly i mean i guess that's one difference in the analogy is that this picture is kind of correct globally so s can be any scheme here whereas this this picture is a kind of only only locally this this is kind of we can only think of these as really being projective objects locally um whereas yeah glo globally you know there might not be enough projectives in the, the subbelian category. So that's that's sort of why the, the theory of derived categories of coherent sheaves and, and closed coherent sheaves is uh, actually very annoying to set up because you can you cannot just use projective resolutions all the time. You need to do some but, more complicated yeah, things. But even the one above you could have started locally too. Yeah, yeah. So you can it would, it would suffice to, to start. Yeah. It would suffice to start locally. I mean, I was uh, what I was yeah, yeah. starting with something compact, but you're saying that it's right. not you start actually only non compact, but then it's no longer pure. Like then you already have things that are have non trivial. Yeah, the price you pay is, I guess, then, um, uh, right. Yeah, the, where I'm getting confused is that if you start with affines, not, um, compact things then you have non-pure like i thought you'd have pure things oh, yeah, yeah. That but, but, and that's why i'm getting confused. okay but uh, maybe maybe this yeah maybe the confusion also is because of some slightly bad notational choice like maybe instead of this curly m is too close to the m of s like the by this i mean the motive of so for any smooth projective variety x over so x is smooth projective over s then um, then there is an object in this category, uh, which is the motive of X relative to S. But um, so this guy is smooth and projective, you know, re relative to, to S, but S itself can be kind of anything. And, you know, we should still expect to have this category. I guess so it's, it's kind of one category level of difference. And this curly M I'm now realizing really looks too, too similar to the, non curly one. So I'll try to be uh you know try to be clear about saying which which one I mean in the next slide. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that that clarifies this. Um yeah and so so what we will what we also can kind of see from um the properties of this conjectural thing is that this thing has to be universal in some sense. This this cohomology theory has has to have some kind of universal universal property um because of the realization functors so for any uh sheaf theory like any of the reasonable sheaf theories such as uh allotic sheaves um so here i maybe mean like ql coefficients or something and um and for you know like betty sheaves you know sheaves on the uh complex analytic space or topological space associated to this scheme um you know we have we have like these six functor formalisms, formalisms here, and we, we have like an allotic realization and a, and a Betty realization. So for every L, so it's actually a bunch of realizations here. And anyway, so these are functors for every S, you know, which are also like natural in S. 
And these are supposed to give you some, you know, when you, when you look at the functoriality of X, you should get some induced maps when we take um, these X groups. And so these should be some kind of, well, this is basically saying that motivic cohomology is kind of universal among, among all these, these cohomology theories. So maybe more generally, one would look at any whale cohomology theory here. Um, so there's kind of some sort of universal thing, except for it's more like, it's a whale cohomology theory defined on non-projective objects as well. Um, so at this point, we should, we should stop and like, I guess maybe I could have tried to quiz the audience, but I mean, some, most people, many people probably already know where this is going. So um, there is one kind of candidate of, of, a, of a, some kind of homology S theory or cohomology S theory, which, which does have maps to those things. Namely, Chow, Chow theory has a cycle class maps, um, except that we only hit sort of the diagonal 2n, n, uh, 2n comma n part of, of these things. So here, yeah, there should be uh, a Tate twist potentially, but sort of all these groups are sort of isomorphic, unless maybe we take cost structures into account or something. But you know, as vector spaces, the this doesn't have any effect. So, um, so this might look more familiar. But yeah, so there's some cycle class maps uh, like this, and in some sense, motivic homology should, you know, we can kind of reduce that motivic homology, whatever it is, should collapse to Chow groups when we look at this, these indices here. Um, so um, at this point, I will write down what Valenson's candidate was. Um, you know, in that, in that same paper, he, he, he wrote down more or less explicitly that, um, you know, this should be related to K-theory somehow. So motivic homology should have a description in terms of the algebraic K-theory so, um, so Q here stands for the fact that we look at rational coefficients. Gamma is the so-called gamma filtration on K-theory. And um, the point is this thing splits up into some, uh, a bunch of direct summons, which are the, the graded, you know, the graded pieces of the gamma filtration. Um, here, this is actually referring to like, so this is some kind of higher algebraic K-theory. You know, usually we we would look at some k zero, and this this is some different, possibly different integer. And um, so here we're we're really looking at uh, some kind of notion of higher k theory. So we'll try to understand, we'll try to come back and understand like what this, you know, what what what's what is this thing, and why, you know, why is Valentin saying that this should be the x groups? Uh, so first of all, um, if we just look at k zero. So the, just the algebraic K-theory of, let's say, coherent sheaves or vector bundles on, on your scheme. Um, this is isomorphic via a Griffin de Primon rock isomorphism to the Chow groups. And um, so there is, a, there is a decomposition. Both of these, I mean, this thing obviously has a decomposition by definition into its yeah, graded homogeneous components. But with rational coefficients, this thing also has this, this uh, decomposition. And sort of these things match up uh, here. So, um, so at least that tells us that when you know when you look at k zero, it is sort of compatible with this expectation here. Um, so, sort of you know, if we restrict this thing to motives of smooth projective objects, we do get something that looks like Chow motives or pure motives. So. I don't know whether this is a yeah. side question or an important question, but you're tensoring with Q. So you're, and you didn't tensor with Q, it still fits into this motive, the motive story, right? So Valenson is only True. Um, happens when you tensor with Q, but there's, right? Like it's not, he's not. There. Um, true, yeah. Uh, so Valenson, you know, said, you know, this should, this should really work for any commutative ring. Um, I think that is sort of, in some sense, that that is not really expected to be true anymore. Like, okay, I mean, there's some sense in which it's expected to be true, um, depending on how you formulate things. But um, on Voivodsky's category of motives, he actually proved that with integral coefficients, 
you cannot have like the motivic t structure cannot exist um, in general on you know with integral coefficients. So that's why he kind of reform reformulated everything with, with rational coefficients. Anyway, like rational coefficients are the by far the most important part of the theory because all these important properties, um, you know, and all the all, also all the con like important conjectures about algebraic cycles, like you know, the Hodge and Tate conjectures and everything. These are really, um, you know, really about the the case of rational coefficients. So, the rational coefficients is kind of the the deep part of the theory that we, you know, really need to understand, um, in order to sort of get a sense of the flavor of, of motives. So I just want to recall briefly this, you know, definition of of K theory. So this is a this is a kind of um, growth in the group on the, this abelian category here. And what that means is that we take uh, an abelian group generated by coherent sheaves or isomorphism classes of coherent sheaves. And then we quotient that by some relations. Anytime we have an exact sequence, we, we say that F should be equal to the sum of, of these other two guys. Uh, so this is this is a cohomology, a kind of generalized cohomology theory that growth and defined, um, you know, in order to prove these kind of riemann roch theorems. Um, but Quillen actually later uh, went and defined these uh, so-called higher um, algebraic K groups. So this is like a huge thing, like going from K0 to these K guys. I mean, this definition is like, this is super easy to define, right? But these things that this required like developing all kinds of new techniques and homotopy theory and um, just like crazy imagination as well. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how um, how we figured out like the right definition. I mean, now we have more conceptual ways of understanding this, but um, his original definition was sort of really amazing that he even came up with this. Um, but sort of motivated by these um, valence and conjectures, like one year later, at least according to the publication date, uh, Bloch actually constructed a theory of higher Chow groups, which is kind of, analogous to this higher K theory. So we have this kind of generalized um, or higher growth and degree monarch isomorphism. Um, and the difference is here, here we have this kind of this P, um, this new new grading. And this 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 corresponds to the sort of the higher K theory grading here. And there's still some gamma filtration on these groups, and and you you still have uh, this this kind of isomorphism. But uh, sorry, there is a missing missing Q. Yeah, so integrally the theories are different, but uh, rationally, uh, oh yeah, on the other side as well. Ah, so he didn't. Yeah, and uh, so, so he didn't define it. Okay, so isn't that he defined higher chi groups in this way? He defined it in some other way, and then proved. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he defined these in a more like cycle theoretic way. And then he proved that, you know, you have uh, many good properties and, and this Riemann Rock isomorphism. I mean, yeah, there was some controversy about the proofs. And then Mark Levine um, wrote, uh, wrote a paper kind of revisiting all these things and sort of giving more convincing proofs. But yeah, there was a sort of long period when you know, people were, um, yeah, there was some controversy, I guess. But uh, anyway, so now, yes. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I'm confused. I mean, I mean, it looks like your definition is somehow G theory, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, yeah. Again, I'm being a bit imprecise about things. So this this is what some people would call K theory. Some people would call G theory. If the schemes are, um, if the schemes are, uh, you know, smooth, then then there's no difference. Um, so if you want, if you want to, um, yeah, I mean, basically this is, this is what I would call K theory, but I really mean, you know, this is what, this is what I mean. But some, some people would call it G theory. I mean, there's different, some people would write this as G zero, but some people would write this as K zero and then they would write K theory vector bundles as K upper zero. So they're just different, yeah, different notations. Like. Yeah. 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 So now if we, if we. If we use this higher Chow groups, which was not available to Bailenson at the time, but if, you know we can formulate, we can reformulate this expectation about X groups or motivic homology a bit more, um, 
yeah, a bit more natural VR, I guess. And if you recall, I mean, the way you were thinking to find pure motives was also looking at algebraic cycles modulo um, some equivalence relation. Um, so there, you know, there's different versions of the theory depending on which equivalence relation you put, but at least this looks like, um, you know, this looks like much more compatible with, uh, with the pure motive story in the first place. So um, I guess one motivation for these things that is kind of critical to mention is that when we look at classical cohomology theories like like entire cohomology and you know singular cohomology, um, pretty much every you know every cohomology theory like that you that you would want to look at, I mean you always have some long exact sequences, right? Like localization and Meyer Torus. You also have some kind of cohomological descent properties, but you know so these these theories, which which I mean they want to be some kind of algebraic versions of of homology or cohomology, right? And by algebraic, I mean that they're really defined purely using algebraic data. I mean, it's not some kind of sheaf cohomology theory or something. It's just sort of, you know, taking algebraic cycles or taking algebraic vector bundles and putting some relations and so on. And and we, we only have this, this right exact localization sequence, but I mean, there's nothing, you know, we cannot really extend this to the, to the left. So, um it's a bit yeah it's a, it's a bit unsatisfying and what these higher groups do is is they let you extend it to the left so here you 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 could put like the chow uh with a comma one this first higher chow group and here you can put k1 of x minus uh sorry there's a typo <laughs> should be the close immersion yeah so yeah, it says it's the usual localization sequence. And um, yeah, and so so we, we have these boundary maps now, which which kind of shift this, shift this, uh, I should say here, KP minus one. Yeah, so that, that's, um, that's nice. Um, and so the way, the way the, these things are defined is actually using some kind of homotopy theory. Um, so you actually define some, some homotopy type or infinity groupoid. I mean, these are basically synonyms. Uh, you can think of this as a homotopy type. That's how topologists would, would think of this. Um, and uh, so it's uh, this one, at least you could think of this as um, taking some chain complex and taking the homology groups. But this one really, uh, you have to use this language of homotopy types. Um, or or infinity groupoids, and if you assemble these things into into like a single object, so th these these objects kind of encode all these homotopy groups, but this is sort of one one collection. Then it's actually a bit nicer to um, to formulate these things because you, you actually have a sort of exact triangle or um, a fiber or cofiber sequence of infinity groupoids or homotopy types. And and this gives you this localization sequence when you take um, when you take the sort of the long exact sequence associated to a fiber sequence. So so what are these? So, so so the gadgets are infinity groupoids, which are like that's infinity comma zero categories, is that right? And then you and there's some notion right. of, and there's some notion of a triangle. Like when I think vibration exact sequence, I usually am being not knowing anything and having a naive idea of topology, I, I privilege which mm -hmm. one's the fiber, but there's some notion of a, an analog of a triangle. Uh, is that right? Or Yeah, so, so, so there are like canonical, canonical base points here and, and this is sort of, yeah, to be more precise, it's sort of, uh, it's kind of pointed, everything is in, in the pointed homotopy types or pointed infinity group points, but actually the, these things live in some, um, yeah, I don't want to use the word spectra just because mm, it's even more complicated than homotopy types, but, but there's some kind of stable version of all this where, where you actually, you have some, you know, something, some triangulated category, basically, um, of spectra, well, it, and, and these are actually distinguished triangles. Except it's better, it sounds like you're, again, a naive algebraic geometer's question is, it sounds like triangulated categories 
feels this is sacrilege, but like the wrong, <laughs> like, like not the right definition. Whereas you're you're saying, I mean, yeah. I'm wondering whether you're saying the right definition are I don't, uh, spectra slash infinity groupoids, and it's a notion of instead of a triangle, there's this thingy and uh, point infinity groupoids, and you have these triangly things with the vibration the exact sequency things. Right. Is that is that what you're? Yeah. Is that how I should be thinking? I mean, uh, yeah, I, th I think I guess we'll come back to it a bit, like pretty shortly. But um, we will see um, some ways in which it's it's clearly beneficial to think of all these um, constructions as living in some infinity category rather than just a triangulated category. You, you, I mean, they do live also in a triangular category. So if you're not familiar with the stable infinity categories and so on, you should, at first pass, you should think of these as some, you know, some distinguished triangles. So maybe sometimes we use this, this notation. Oh, maybe, so these are really some, yeah. Maybe the reason I'm asking this is, so Sean Cotner and I were actually talking earlier today about, uh, because someone, a, a new grad student proposed a reading course in infinity categories. And it, if it's better, like, I feel like, saying learn triangulated categories first and use that as a baby version. I wonder if that's, you're suggesting that's going astray and you're saying like you learn this, instead you should just go straight for the right thing and, you know, dive into it. And uh, so, uh, and if you were to say, no, don't do that, that's like a pretty serious warning. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, if, but if you were to say, yes, that's the right way to think of, uh, uh, of this, and then from that you get long exact sequences, and from that you get like that. That if that's the better way to think about things, that would be. I, I mean, if that's the way our you know in 500 years when we are flying cars, if that's what everyone will be doing, maybe it's better to start thinking that way right away and just throw triangular categories in the in the garbage. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess this is a question about sort of. Um, how to how to sort of learn things for the first i mean so it kind of depends on your background i mean i would say if you've never seen derived categories before then and you start learning into stable infinity categories for me that's sort of i mean it's not you're just going to be confused i think i mean you're not going to understand why i mean you might understand the definitions but you want to understand sort of why why the definitions <laughs> so um so but, I, you know but is that, but, that's, but, is that sort of, but is that an artifact of history of, of like the way in which we learn things and we learn them i mean you have tenure now so i mean I, I, yeah <laughs> i mean I, I i would say that probably in the in the future i don't know how much of the future but i would say at some point it would be possible to learn infinity categories without reading a thousand pages of, of you know higher topos theory or something but we're now, not at that point i would say yeah okay. then then you then you should should just do that but right now it's it's sort of there's you you need some motivation before you you start i mean great you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, but that's just my my personal take, which is now recorded oh, for posterity on YouTube, sorry, I guess. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what because you you say that they they have stable version. So 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 do you, do you say that for example the first line uh, are these things? I mean, infinity monoids or something. I mean, you have. Uh, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are, I mean, these are infinity yeah, groups I'm or curious, but, yeah. but the first line, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah that's also, uh, I mean, in fact, this is, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so yeah, but we will see some kind of definition of it soon. So maybe that will help also. Oh, um, okay, because because Ravi mentioned something like, I mean, I mean, the difference between, but because in general, I mean, I mean, things, I mean, how to say. Well, 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 well. In, infinity groups are different from because they are not stable. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I, I'm being imprecise here when I when I say. But I mean, you, that's why I said you should maybe think of this as just a fiber sequence at first. But yeah, we we will come back and make this a bit more precise. Maybe I should just move on, and then you could ask again oh, in a couple of slides, I guess. Um. So the, fir the first, yeah, the first like definition, the first pass of the definition I'm going to give is, is uh, extremely sketchy, but hopefully we'll convey the, some intuition. Um, so the way this thing is defined, maybe I should put a star here because there's no Q on the right-hand side. Um, but 
yeah, basically we're we're looking at algebraic cycles and you know imposing the rational equivalence relation, but we want to do it up to homotopy in some sense. Um, so rather than saying you know two things are equal, we want to say they're they're kind of there is a homotopy between them, and we want to remember that that homotopy. So we're thinking, you know I remember everything is now in this language of homotopy types rather than sets or intrinsic groupoids. So intrinsic groupoids or you know so intrinsic groupoids you can think of you know objects and some kind of isomorphisms between them. Or if you're thinking of homotopy types, you think of some points and paths between them. And and sort of you, if you're just saying two things are equal, then you know you're kind of forgetting the path. You're just collapsing those two things to the same point. But here you're kind of remembering some extra information. So instead of saying these are equal, we're just going to sort of impose some explicit homotopy between between these two things. And so this is this is a kind of intuition, and it's really difficult to kind of make this into an actual definition. But um, yeah, so. Uh, I will try to to give some motivation for what comes next. If you have a set and an equivalence relation on the set, you can you can consider this diagram. Um, so you have two maps to to your to your set, of course, I mean corresponding to to the two projections of this thing, and you, you have um, a map in the in the other direction, which is kind of the sort of the, uh, yeah like the diagonal i guess so the diagonal lives in r because it's a reflexive relation and so you you can think of this as as this diagram and and now the quotient for some reason we might want to write this as a co-limit um so that that will boil down to the co-equalizer so it's uh, it's a bit maybe a bit artificial why am i why am i doing it this this way but um yeah, I just want to sort of uh, motivate the next definition like this. So, um, it, once when you when you write the when you write this diagram, right? So now, I mean, you can also think of think of having a, a groupoid G whose objects are these ones. The morphisms are the elements of R, right? And so a morphism, so like home between. So basically, you you have a map from A to B. A and B are elements of A. A map here exists if and only if you know you have um, if these 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 things are um, identified under the equivalence relation. So if this belongs to R and and this is clearly a groupoid because because it's an equivalence relation. And then now this is a groupoid, and if you take the the set of connected components of that groupoid, you you get just the quotient, right? Okay, so we're getting a bit closer to infinity groupoids now. Um, <laughs> but sort of now to, to get infinity groupoids, we kind of make this this drastic jump of looking at uh, simplicial objects rather than um, these you know simple diagrams here. And uh, you know if you've never seen a simple simplicial object before, I mean you should just think of this as some kind of huge diagram, infinite diagram, where you have a bunch of maps. Uh, which is somehow, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to motivate, but it, it's a bit related. It's a bit similar to chain complexes. So if, if you're in an abelian category, that there's some kind of dual con correspondence, and you can think of this as a some chain complex. But yeah, in general, we we, we have this kind of natural notion of simplicial object, and sort of this will give us infinity groupoids somehow. So you know, groupoids look like diagrams like this, and infinity groupoids look like diagrams like this in some sense. I mean, this is again very it's, it's, imprecise, but it's it, it's completely unfair for me to ask a question at this point because you're that all. <laughs> <laughs> but but okay, so you described a groupoid, but there's like a choice of how you presented it, and so similarly, presumably the infinity groupoid, you there's like some well i guess the answer your, your answer is going to be yes or something <laughs> but uh, like, <laughs> it's some way of describing it but there are many other ways of describing the same thing so you're sort of not okay i guess it's not even a question okay that's right uh, or you could say yes <laughs> right <laughs> right right i mean yeah maybe we should think of this as like a, a, a presentation of an infinity group right? um but yeah basically what i want to do is give a an explicit presentation of you know a, a specific infinity groupoid. Um, so I want to get back to this this block um, 
yeah, this is higher child group thing. So the way we do this is we define an algebraic version of, um, of the standard n simplex. So k is a field, let's say. Then you look at you know the algebraic variety defined by these equations. If you think about it, it looks kind of like a simplex, right? And so it's isomorphic to to just these affine spaces. And you can put you can define like face and degeneracy maps and, and make this into some kind of co-simplicial object. And therefore, by functoriality of um, of cycles, you 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 have some kind of diagram like this. So that's actually where this is imprecise and um, to make this precise, one should really look at some sub uh, subgroups here, where um, you put some extra conditions. So, like, let me just call it good position. Um, so you're only looking at cycles, meaning you're only looking at cycles which intersect properly with the with these, um, you know, the face maps, so that these maps are actually well defined. But now um, you have this this um, this uh, simplicial object, and you know instead of taking a equalizer, now you, you take some whatever geometric realization of a simplicial object. But but yeah, this is basically the definition of the bluff cycle complex. And and um, when we take so when when we take just the pi zero of this, so the you know kind of connected components of this infinity groupoid, it's it's corresponding to just taking the actual co equalizer of this of this last part. And if you think about it, well, this is this is nothing. This is an affine space. And if you think about what these maps are doing, so this is kind of like restricting to the zero section or you know, restricting to zero in, in the A1 and restricting to one in A1. Um, that's equivalent to like, that, that, that is basically rational equivalence, except maybe you normally would write this with P1 and you know, zero and infinity, but it's, it's the same thing. So this is, this is just saying that, you know, you're you're taking rational equivalence and, and sort of imposing that relation, but you're doing it now in in this sort of higher or homotopical sense and keeping track of all these extra homotopies and not just taking the pi zero. Yeah, so that's my attempt to give some some kind of uh, idea of what, what the higher uh, yeah higher child groups are. So now let's let's go back to like okay, now that we understand what the X groups are supposed to be, right? How would we actually define um, uh, any triangulated category where those X groups are are you know appearing? Um, and so, yeah, it's actually it's actually like um, it's actually quite quite cool. I don't know if I fully appreciated this before I, I was preparing these lectures, um, but you can actually give like a much more slick definition of of the Dirac category motives using some modern machinery. So um, there's, a, there's a kind of counterpart of the theory of derived categories in the world of infinity category theory, which um, also works for kind of non-abelian things. So this also basically in some form before infinity categories existed, this was due to Quillen, and this was what he called kind of non-abelian derived categories. Um, and this is how we define the cotanian complex as some kind of non abelian derived functor of the, you know, the cotanian sheaf. And um, and now, nowadays, like very recently, this is this is usually called uh, animation by uh, Clausen and and Schulze. They introduced this terminology, but but it's the theory is due in in the infinity category language. The theory is due to Jacob Leary. Okay, so so what what is this? I mean. It gives us a way to kind of define a derived category um, in a in a maybe, pretty, but, yeah, pretty maybe, slick, slick way. Maybe, yeah, maybe let me interrupt before you get into what's going to be super exciting, uh, which is this is the yeah. I mean, here again, I feel like you're about to say something which one would imagine that maybe it's too far in the future that this is the right way to do things, and we should start here. But just no one has explained it. Well, maybe you're about to uh, in such a way that. Will, will, will that that I mean that this will be a very satisfactory and you wanted a motivation. I mean, you said if you're unmotivated, this stuff is just very mysterious. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the cotangent complex, which is a very motivating thing. Uh, so mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm I'm I, I mean, I'm saying in advance, I'm not even paying attention to this slide as you know very much. But is this potentially like 
but maybe this is, I mean, is it necessary for our heads to explode to uh, when looking at the slide for the, and bypassing drive categories first? And it's, and like, is, this could be a motivation for, like, this seems to be potentially the thing. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that, I mean, I think the general theory of derived categories of abelian categories is like really complicated. I think we, I mean, once we internalize everything, we kind of forget how like technical it was to learn. But um, I think if you go back, I mean, it's just, yeah, all these like injective resolution and stuff, it's, it's really, it's really technical. And every time you prove something about, you know, coherent cohomology and, and things like this, you have to, or about the draft category, you, you have to deal with these kind of annoying technicalities, which I mean, it, yeah, I, I think I mean, I somehow feel, uh, you know, I know I'm distracting you to be continually doing what you want to say, but, but <laughs> the things that come up into drive categories are, I feel triangulated categories feel like the wrong note. I mean, a drive category is a triangulated category, but the drive category is something you can often kind of get your hands on and you know, build and talk about, then you have to worry about, well, it's equivalent to this, and then you have to worry about those choices. And it feels like a drive category is not so bad. The triangulated category and making that, saying, making a statement about triangulated categories, it, that's why I feel like it, it feels like the wrong definition. Whereas when you prove something in the drive category, that sometimes, I mean, if you're, depending on how, what you need to prove can be not so bad. And the way in which it's not so bad might be, this might make the jump here not so bad. I mean, you know, build it. I mean, the simplicial thing you're building. Well, okay, now I'm out of, I, I, I'm not saying this as someone who's proposing. I'm saying I understand this and I propose this way we should do it. It's, I don't understand this, but want to. And it's, I wonder if this is the right way for me to rebuild my understanding. Mm. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, I mean, obviously that's not what I'm going to explain in these lectures, but. Right. I mean, um, I'm not going to ask him seven minutes for me to say, or you know, I'm going over time. Right. But uh, but it's more because so, uh, really what these lectures also are doing are really nicely saying how one should think about things, so we understand things and also set the stage for thinking about future things we we'll want to think about. So yeah, so this is why this is right valuable. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, maybe I can. One thing I can say is that. I mean, a couple of years ago, I tried to, um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I taught a, a, a uh, like a lecture series on, you know, basically explaining this whole theory with the, yeah, basically with the goal of like constructing, actually the goal was like hit theoretic stuff, but then sure, as part of it, I, I kind of, in like two or three lectures, I set up like the whole um, formalism of like derived categories and like the, the you know, six functors on, on those and stuff. And I, yeah, I realized that the whole theory, like, you know, I mean, as, as you know, like to actually do that precisely, I mean, it took like a lot of work. I mean, all this work of like Lippmann and like Spaltenstein and stuff until we got like the most general theory in the end. It's just really complicated homological algebra. But um, what, what you can do in an infinite category is much more slick because you can say, well, locally on every scheme, you know, you have, enough projective objects. And when you have projective objects, the draft categories are easy. Uh, but in infinity category land, you can actually work locally because you have like like descent in, in some homotopical sense, which you don't have at the triangle category level. But anyway, so I'm, I'm getting, sort of getting sidetracked, but but um, this is sort of, yeah, this, this, this theory of animation or derived, you know, infinity categories that I think is, is a really nice aspect of the theory that kind of, Really has some advantages over, over, um, yeah, over, over the previous some some previous formulas. Um, yeah. So so sorry. Sorry. So, so there's a technique or market here. You 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 have to replace projective by compact projective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, that's why I was kind of before I was saying um, finite projective. Yeah, the precise definition, of course, as you say, is. Is compact and projective. So thanks for the correction. Yeah. Oh, that was careful. Yeah, um, the, careful. The quotes there were very carefully placed. To, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So. Okay. So basically, what 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 this does is like okay, you take some category of of 
projective objects. I mean, what does it mean to take a category of projective objects? Then? So basically you take any category, right? And, and this will become the compact projective objects in the, the resulting construction. And so um, there is some construction, which I, I call a hat right now, uh, they call it the animation, but that's some infinity category, um, which contains the original thing as a, as a full subcategory of compact projective objects. Um, so in some sense, we should think of these as, you know, basically it's a category of things that have resolutions by, by, by these ones, right? Like projective resolutions by the objects in here. And uh, in some, you know, if, you, if you're more comfortable with category theory, I mean, it's, it's basically, by definition, it's built out of filtered co-limits. So filtered co-limits, you should think of this as like, you know, increasing union. So we've, if we had the word finite or compact here, we could get infinite type objects as well, not just, you know, finitely generated projective modules, for example, but um, bigger ones too. And geometric realizations, which is sort of the more important thing, which is uh, going back to things like this, right? Um, and, and things like, like this. So it's sort of saying that, okay, if we, even if we start with like sets or something, we will end up with something like infinity groupoids when we, when we allow these simplicial gadgets. And geometric realization is just the analog of taking the co-equalizer for a, a simplicial object. Um, so, okay, I mean, whatever it is, I, you know, it, it has these properties. And then, and then finally, you, you do some additional stuff, which is kind of inverting suspension, um, so kind of stabilizing it. So this, you know, this, this is based on the topolo topological analogy. So suspension is like, you know, suspension in the topological sense. But maybe some examples will help. Maybe I should start with the usual homological algebra example. Namely, if you take, if you start with the category of finitely generated projective modules, then the first, the a hat part gives you the, you know, um, yeah, e either, I guess depending on your grading conventions, it would be uh, homologically non-negative or cohomologically non-positively graded derived category to R. And then this extra step just, so the suspension in this world corresponds to shifting and sort of you force shifting to become invertible. So that means you need to be able to shift in the other direction. So then you end up with the, with the direct category. I mean, intuitively, that's how it works. You can also do something like completely non-abelian. That's sort of the, mm, the extra yeah, advantage here. And you can start with finite sets and you end up with, um, with uh, infinity groupoids and then you, you stabilize and you get the spectra. So that's sort of what I alluded to earlier. Um, so yeah, the, the funny thing is that, I mean, no one has ever used this as a definition, but sort of just uh, preparing the lectures today, I realized that there's a completely valid definition now that you have the theory of infinity categories, um, is that you can, you can start with the, the category of child motives, which is you know, relatively straightforward to define. Um, we, last time we, we saw some sketch of the definition when S is a spectrum of a field, but you can do everything sort of relative. You can find correspondences relative to a base scheme and, and you have a, a well-defined category like this. Um, and, and then you can, you can do this construction that we just saw, this, uh, this thing, and, and you get some, some category which um, you put together the definition. And so uh, there's work by Bandarko and yeah, Feng Zhou Jin that showed that this actually is equivalent to more standard definitions. But I, I just, yeah, I think it's really slick. But okay, it does have the disadvantage compared to Loyosi's definition. It has the disadvantage that we kind of, we have to start with this child motives as we kind of impose that into it. Whereas Loyosi's definition, you kind of, you don't, it looks like more canonical in some sense. Like you're not, you're kind of almost out of thin air. You're just producing something, which then you compute that actually the X groups are what you want and it gives you channel motives as a subcategory. We I should start getting to the end here, but, but just, yeah, so on the other hand, you can also do, um, uh, let me mention Wojewski's definition briefly. Um, um, so, so you convinced maybe, me, so you convinced yeah. me in the previous slide uh, first that 
okay, maybe no one made that definition. Uh, in that, like that's the wrong, uh, but then you seem to convince that that's me that that's the right definition for the future. And then you just immediately derail that by saying, in fact, <laughs> that in fact, you know, but this, uh, okay, uh, you, so there's this very clean, this looks very clean. And then, and I guess I don't mind sham motives so much since they're kind of geometric and nice. And, but now you're saying Vyvodsky is, is also the right definition because it builds it out of nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, the more definitions, the better, I guess. So, you know, the more equivalent things we have, the more, True. Yeah, the more tools we have. Um, somehow, yeah, for me, I would say like Vyvodsky's definition is a, in some you know sense like it's a definition from the book or something right whereas this one is like yeah i think you you have to sort of be a bit clever to kind of realize like why grosnick's definition of channel is, is the right one i mean you have to kind of be familiar with a lot of these ideas a bit um whereas like Vyvodsky's definition is just kind of like there's almost nothing there right i mean um you, you start with smooth schemes you do this this construction that I mentioned before. I mean, he didn't formulate it this way, but you could formulate it this way if you wanted. Um, and then you just impose two relations. You say that for any scheme, for any uh, smooth scheme, some smooth S scheme, um, you you impose a relation that the A1, you know, so A1 over X, meaning, you know, so A1, X times A1, you contract this guy to, to x, so you know, you invert this thing, and uh, secondly, if you have a so-called Nisnevich square, I mean, so this is some, yeah, this is like a version of the Atal topology, but actually, let me, yeah, maybe I could so, also say that. So, so the definition yeah. on the previous page makes no the phrase Nisnevich never appears. Yes. Okay. Yes. True. This one, yeah, this one, it, it could look like a choice, like why are you doing this image? I mean, I can say like rationally, um, you could you could just work with Ital covers here instead, if that looks more canonical. Um, there are good reasons though why, like, yeah, if I had more time, I could, I think I could, I could uh, sell the Nisnevich topology a bit better than, than it usually is somehow. But yeah, it's, a, it's kind of, yeah, maybe it's kind of finite version of the Ital topology in some sense. Um, but anyway, so so then there, then there's a theorem that oh yeah I also forgot to sort of invert p one so this is kind of like inverting basically corresponds to inverting the Tate motive, which uh, you also do in, and so inverting yeah this this is kind of where Tate twists you can have negative Tate twists and things like that. Um, but yeah so anyway then you you get a category where the X groups are actually higher shock groups. I mean this is a deep you know very very like important and non-trivial theorem of Vygotsky that. Um, that this actually, I mean, as you can see, there's nothing about algebraic cycles. I mean, it's just, it's it's just like okay. I mean, you start. It's kind of like you do Ital sheaves, but, um, but you know, you do Nisnevich sheaves, and then you you want to impose a one invariance. But okay, if you just work with the Ital side, then a one doesn't live in there because it's it's not Ital. So okay, fine. Let's just change to the smooth side. So we have enough room for this a one. And basically, this is a universal thing, which is which is kind of a one homotopy invariant. And then suddenly, you 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 just get higher child groups out of nowhere. Um, so I think that's that's really surprising. And I mean, in some sense, tells us that this you know this is like a very fundamental thing. Um, and then there's also a theorem. So this is basically Vygotsky plus Ayub and Sutinsky degrees and others, but this thing actually admits a six month of formalism. And so, so we have this kind of theory of derived motivic sheaves. So we have a kind of derived version of Bailenson's conjectures at least. And then if we want to go back to Bailenson's original conjecture, now we can reformulate it as saying that there's a motivic key structure on, the, on this category. And motivic has some precise meaning. I mean, if it's motivic, I mean, first of all, it should be non-degenerate. And second of all, it should be compatible with the perverse um, perverse T structures under realization. So if you if you take the realization to tau sheaves or singular, um, you know, Betty sheaves, then it should be uh, compatible with the perverse T structures on those categories. And then if you you know the obviously you can get from this to this by taking the derived category and it will have the multiple T structure, but you can also go in the other direction and 
and sort of take the heart of the T structure when, when it exists and you get back your abelian category. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> um, this is hard, <laughs> this is hard to prove. Um, so there's actually if and only if statement here. Um, so there are many names that kind of proved various things here like um, Kanamura, who also constructed his own version of the derived category of motives. And um, yeah, Balenson. Uh, Balenson showed, yeah, both of them showed one of the implications. And then Vandarko also showed that if you have the motivity structure only on um, an algebraically closed field, so just, you know, for S equals Becco and algebraically closed field, then you can actually bootstrap it using the six functor formalism to a full motivity structure on, you know, for every like a perverse motivity structure for every every scheme S. So so you you would really be able to get back valence and conjecture from, from that statement. Um, so lastly I want to mention this other very important conjecture, which is uh, called conservativity, which is just saying that okay there's a you know Betty realization. I mean there's an analog for the realization. Um, but if you take uh, a motive over spec C, then uh, there's a realization to, you know, so to Betty Shee's on spec C, which is just derived category of two vector spaces. And here we have to restrict to the compact or objects or the geometric objects. Yeah, sometimes they're called constructible objects as well. But, you know, these are kind of the, this is sort of, as before, the, you know, we were looking at, um, there was this question about uh, finiteness conditions. So this is basically the finite version of PM. And uh, yeah, so the, the conjecture is that this is a conservative, meaning that if you have a an if you have a morphism of motives, you should be able to check if it's an isomorphism after realization. Or if you have a motive and you want to show that it's zero, you should be able to check this after realization. Uh, but you can get a sense of why this is hard because saying that a morphism is invertible um, in this category means that you have to construct an inverse to it. And constructing an inverse, so that's some morphism in this category, and that means that's some kind of algebraic cycle, basically, at the end of the day. And so the the statement that this this is conservative actually is some kind of non-trivial thing about existence of algebraic cycles. So if you prove conservativity, at some point you have to sort of, in some sense, you have to, you have to be constructing some algebraic cycles somewhere. And, and kind of this is just hard; it's always hard to construct algebraic cycles. And um, yeah, so for example, like just to sort of mention that this does have some connection with uh, you know geometry and yeah basic questions about algebraic cycles such as um, box conjecture on zero cycles on on surfaces. So it is known that conservativity would actually imply box conjecture. So you have smooth projective surface or the complex numbers with no non-trivial two forms, then the Albanese map is injected. Uh, this you know very concrete statement can actually be proven using all this machinery of motives, if you allow yourself to assume this, this statement, which is deceptively simple. Yeah, so I guess I went over, well, 10 minutes over time, so sorry for taking too much time, but yeah, I'll stop here. Thanks.